Hi guys, welcome back to another video. Uh, today I want to talk about, continue to talk about, well, the themes of men and women and sex and values in relationships and uh, the values that emerge out of literature. And I want to continue on when we were talking about virginity the other day with a special, a special look at Goethe's The Sorrows of Young Ver Werther. As I said in a video yesterday, this is one of my absolute favorite works. It's powerful. It's overwhelming. It is the quintessence of a tragic love story. It's funny that it's, it's not as well known as the tragic story of Romeo and Juliet, or of course, some of the even some of the other stories in the English language, like the stories of Jane Austen and uh, Wuthering Heights and so on. I guess it's because it's, uh, it's, it was originally a German, German book, but it translates very well. And, you know, the, the beauty of Goethe's language, of course, can't be translated. But nevertheless, the beauty of his expression, of his ideas, of timing, of perception. I think the thing that, that strikes me most about the sorrows of young Werther are the expressions, these, and it's hard, it's hard for someone. Okay. So knowing Werther or sorry, knowing Goethe, knowing his story, Goethe was always a winner basically. Um, now it can be argued that this early work wasn't him at his winningness, winningest, it certainly consolidated him as a literary figure, as a leading German literary figure. So the modesty, the spiritual poverty out of which Goethe was writing is reflected in the sorrows. And I don't know, like not being an expert, I don't know if he would have been able to write a work like this in his later age. I think that's one of the things that artists fear is that their art depends on their personal suffering. I mean, that's a relative notion, isn't it? Like if you look at someone like Leo Tolstoy, his suffering only grew with his success. That's the way with some artists. Tolstoy, his suffering peaked around the time of writing his masterpiece, Anna Karenina. And in many ways, his skill continued to grow and remained in place, even though his final novel, Resurrection, isn't as psychologically elegant as Anna Karenina. It is a masterpiece, and Tolstoy's skill in writing never waned, even at, to, even at the end of his life. And I think this, the same thing can be said with Goethe, the masterpieces of his later life he never he never waned in his writing skill in fact he continued to grow but the question is did the pathos of sorrows remain and i, I simply don't have that information uh at this point anyway but i would point out and that uh you know goethe became the most celebrated writer of his time certainly certainly in the german language and with someone like byron the most celebrated writer of his age so the question is then, do the sorrows of Goethe remain? You know, the sorrows of Werther remain. The sorrows is the testimony of the artistic soul. And that is why it so strongly appealed to the young men of his time. This was an artist expressing the, the pains, the loves, the ideals of the young intellectuals of his age the fans of of sorrows would be people like keats these idealist romantics right people like mary shelley and even her husband all these people felt and idealized the life of the soul of the heart like a religion and this is one thing that comes clearly across i said it yesterday in the video I said that for, for Goethe, for 
and, and his alter ego, I suppose, were there. No, I was speaking of Dante, actually. But no discrepancy needs to be made here. It's the same spirit that's animating them. Although with Goethe and, and Werther, it's not explicitly Christian as it is for Dante. But Werther, a.k.a. Goethe, they felt like Dante felt. And Werther and Lotta, Charlotte, are no different from Dante and Beatrice. It's another age and time, but the, the same spirit, the same emotions unite the two works. These beautiful love stories. Strange love stories, but beautiful love stories. Perfect love stories. Let me add then that, so when I talked about virginity, the video on virginity, virginity is an expression of, or a manifestation of the idealism that undergirds certain aspects of literature this idealism is nowhere more apparent or better expressed than in the Romantic era. The works of the great Romantic figures are, are all about this and their greatness consists in this. They're reacting against the works of their parents and grandparents, the works of the enlightenment of rationalism. Let's contrast their poets, the metaphysicians that were celebrated in the 18th century versus, well, the, I suppose the first romantic in the English language, Wordsworth. It was rec I was recently reminded of the fact that even someone like J.S. Mill, his life was changed by reading Wordsworth. I think uh, it was Wordsworth's prelude. This says something to me about how powerful the romantic movement was. And you say, well, how is it so what what characterizes this romantic movement what makes it so special you just need to look at someone like mill this great rationalist this great this great disciple of the mind being blown away reading wordsworth now i'm blown away reading wordsworth but i'm a fruitcake i'm a nut bar i'm a <laughs> you know keats is my man you know this is this is everything um, I guess we all look at ourselves in funny different ways, don't we? Some people would look at a person and, and see a rationalist where that person might describe themselves as a hopeless romantic. Well, there's two sides to a personality, but at, at the same time, remember last in the video I talked, are there two kinds of people? Well, Goethe talks about that in The Sorrows. He says that in, in, a, in a passage, in a beautiful passage, and I'll, and I'll put a clip of it here in this video he's talking with I think it's Charlotte's husband or I guess he's probably just her fiance at this point Werther is saying that there are people for whom things like love are as determinative as a physical reality so you can't like the character wants to say and this would be so fundamental to the young romantic movement that the movements of the heart are as powerful and as determinative as any other physical reality like diabetes or <laughs> the color of your skin or the language you speak the fact that you are hit by a car you can't say well just get up and walk it off you can't get up and walk it off he makes a powerful argument here it's not a powerful argument as much as a powerful illustration of romantic of the romantic philosophy that these are realities love is a reality that can no more be ignored than being hit by a car or being come down or coming down with cancer these aren't choices people who are in love madly in love feel powerless don't they do you remember back when when we look back we can sometimes say my gosh i was so immature what was i thinking if i had only known that life is so much more or that people aren't worth this or women you know women aren't worth this women are, are aren't worth this kind of devotion because they're flighty uh, women are con as controlled by sex their sex drives as men are why do we pedestalize women this is what young men do all young men hmm I don't know. So that was my argument last time. That was the question I raised last time. 
Virginity is an ideal, but it's one based upon some biological facts. So I want to make an illusion here, not an illusion, but I want to quote a, a passage from a video I watched today, and it's Brett, Brett Weinstein speaking. He's being interviewed by Lex Friedman, and I'll put the link I'll put the link here in the description or on the video here itself. I, I think this deserves to be quoted here. Weinstein is a evolutionary biologist, okay? And so this is part of the consideration that has to be brought in, in here. Now, what Keats didn't know in 1820 and what Goethe didn't know in 1820 or whenever, whenever uh, Sorrows was written, was, was anything from the philosophy of, that emerged from Darwin and Freud. Now, they certainly understood that there was a correlation between states of mind and states of body. That was, that was an old, old idea. They talked about the humors. Now, the humors are as useful a way of speaking about the relationship between your physical self and your mental health as anything else that we get from Darwin or Freud, by useful I mean they, they acknowledge that there is a correlation between the two. Okay, The question that Lex Friedman and Weinstein are talking about here is the relationship between biology, so evolution, and monogamy. Now, it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because a simplistic reading of Darwin would have us conclude that what nature is telling us to do, telling men to do, is procreate as widely and as quickly as possible. And that's a, that's a conclusion that you can draw from biology. That's a, that's a conclusion you can draw from looking at the lives of whatever, otters or lions or whatever. But as Friedman, sorry, as Weinstein says, he says there's a, there's a big difference between what our bio biology wants of us and what our morals want of us. And, and the first thing he, he points to is genocide. He says that there's this lesson from, from biology that we should, we should, we should cooperate in, in genocide because this is the furtherance of our selfish genes. Now, he says, that I'm not going to do that. I'm, I'm going to take a step back and I'm not going to do that because that wouldn't make me happy. That's just, I'd rather die, you know. And, and so here we have a evolutionary biologist telling us that biology shouldn't define us, right? It's, it's, it's a different perspective than that of Werther's argument with Charlotte's fiance, but, but they parallel each other in some ways. And I'll, and I'll put them both on, on the video here so you can look at them side by side. This is, I'm going to quote, I'm going to quote Weinstein now. He says, do not bypass the possibility that what you are supposed to do is find somebody worthy, somebody who can handle it, somebody who you're compatible with and that you don't have to be perfectly compatible. It's not about dating until you find the one, the one. It's about finding someone whose underlying values and viewpoints are complementary complementary to yours that you fall in love find some person you know that you can fall in love with that that person you opt out together he says get out of this damn system that's telling you what's what's sophisticated to think about love and romance and sex he says ignore it to get together that's the key he says and i believe you'll end up laughing in the end if you do it you'll discover wow, that's a hellscape that I opted out of. And this thing I opted into is so much better. Yeah, it's complicated, it's difficult and all that. But, but isn't that something? And, and he talks about the damn system, okay? What is the damn system? The damn system is the modern, he's talking about, he's talking about what he tells university students. And so the system is what we're being told by, by the world is good, and it's not. It's not good, he's saying. It doesn't make for happy people. He says, 
and he talks about his own his own monogamous marriage he says this is what makes makes us happy in a way isn't he, he he's he's kind of going to the same place as Goethe or Werther but he's he's reasoning in a completely opposite way he's saying that biology points you in one direction but morality points you in another whereas Goethe is saying through Werther that biology makes this idealized love inescapable so he's making the opposite argument of Weinstein so there so there you have it it's um but you end up in the end in the same place because as both Weinstein and Werther would agree, is that happiness is is in the same place. It's in this idealized, beautiful, romantic love. Now, Weinstein, he doesn't say perfect. In fact, he says the opposite. He says not perfect, but good, complementary, all these things. I think a lot of us can agree with that. I think an older person would say, yeah, complementary, not ideal, because ideal doesn't exist I think maybe he would say even ideal is bad I don't know I'd have to ask him that is ideal bad this is the question for authors isn't it is ideal bad I think that the tendency today with people like you know being governed by people like Freud and Darwin is that the ideal is bad now Werther can't get behind that Keats can't get behind that I think old man Goethe can get behind that he he ended up in a loving relationship uh, with someone of a lower status than him generally I guess monogamous sort of monogamous <laughs> so old man Goethe is more of a pragmatist than than young idealist Werther and and, pro and and I think probably even more of a pragmatist than than Weinstein but young man Werther he can't there's no such thing as pragmatism and certain and, and great literature is built on that and and the greatest literature I'd say the romantic literature is built upon the conviction that the ideal is right and that there should be no compromises with the ideal and I'll just remind, I'll just point back then to the things that I said about virginity, how sexual, uh, sexual history complicates and undermines the rewards possible to a monogamous relationship. The romantics can't have complications like that in a, in a way. Well, they can, but it's interesting, you know, what would young men were there? I mean, he would take back Charlotte in a second, even after her marriage with the other man was consummated. I mean, that seems to be, that seems to be certainly true. It's, it's certainly worth, worth thinking about to some, to some extent. Now, romanticism, says young Werther, is based upon our human biology. It doesn't come out of nowhere. It is the right and full and healthiest expression, the truest expression of of human biology and Weinstein is kind of saying that too but in a much more moderate moderated degree can we love anything as much as we love Werther can we tolerate can we put side by side anything with Werther or Romeo and Juliet and what happens when we start digging through into the details one of the most famous love relationships in the Roman world was that of Aeneas and Dido what happens when we start digging into that and what happens when we start digging into Jane Austen's heroes and heroines are these people marrying for love how much are they marrying for love and how much are they marrying for money and not just money but social status and gentlemanly conduct gentlemanly achievement if we think about it when Austin discusses a man's manners how much of that is actually really when we get right down to it right down to the biological right down to the evolutionary biological foundation how much of manners and gentlemanly conduct is 
what we would call alpha status. A man can't be a gentleman unless he's had the money, the freedom, the money, the training, the trapping of a polished upbringing. I mean, you can certainly tell, like, if, if, you, if you had two men walk into a room and they were both nicely dressed, but one was a millionaire and the other was, I don't know, high, high five figures, you would, there would be something, something hard to describe, but noticeable anyway, between them. You'd notice the difference in the watch. One had a pretty good watch and one had a Rolex. Even if you couldn't tell it was a Rolex, it was a hundred thousand dollar watch or whatever. The shoes were somewhat different. The suit, one suit was fitted and one was off the shelf. The haircut, the glasses, you know, the same thing can be said for, you know, I would look at two people from Jane Austen's time and not be, probably not be able to readily tell the difference between who was wealthier and who wasn't, but Jane Austen could. So there's, there's, a, we today have a cynical attitude when we approach these things. And one of the things that's pointed out and discussed, for instance, in the book I was talking about yesterday, The Little History of Literature, that if we look back at, for instance, Jane Austen's hero heroines, um, how many got their money from slavery? That's the way we approach things today. How tall were her heroines? And how authentic was love? I think any, any great author entertains these ideas and we see them in Tolstoy as well you know in the jealousy of uh, Levin with respect to his wife Kitty when he talks about other men how they look and how they're dressed and their physiques there's an underlying sexual jealousy now we have all these things playing through our minds and they're always there whether the author is a contemporary author who's aware of the latest theories of, of biology and evolution. What about idealism? Can ideal can Keats and Werther's idealism exist today in a world governed by these ideas that tend to want to push us in a cynical direction? I'm going to leave you with that. That'll be our final thought for today. Thanks so much for listening, guys.